Hey, it's Mr. Palmer, and I just want to talk a little bit about the purpose of this two-part video that I'm going to be putting together for you. The design of this is to not serve as a whole review of the agriculture unit, but rather to look at agriculture and its connections across other units, specifically the urban unit and the economic development, industrialization aspects of the course. So do not consider this a complete review of agriculture, even though it does cover some el lots of elements of agriculture, but it's more of just to look at the connections across units, particularly between urban and economic development. Hope you find this useful. Take care. Howdy, everybody. This is Mr. Palmer. We're going to take a big dive into agriculture and its connections to urban and development units in order to get you ready for the AP exam. How is it that the number of farmers can be declining, but production is increasing? We can see over time that agricultural production has been continuing to increase. Now, how is this happening? This is a critical question that you need to be able to answer. And it relates to the type of farming and the capitalization of farming, the capital intensive natures of that and the improvements that have gone on. So you need to be aware of that. And at the same time, the share of labor force employment, as we see here, some parts of the world are very labor intensive with lots of people working in agriculture. But other areas of the world, like the United States and Western Europe, not as high a percentage of people work in agriculture, but yet these areas produce some of the greatest outputs of agriculture. So you need to understand how that's happening. So make sure that you read a little bit about that. Sectors of the economy, you need to know these. Um, the agriculture and mining is in the primary sector. Secondary is manufacturing. I know some of you didn't get the manufacturing sector of this, but you got to know that that means manufacturing because all four of these sectors work together in agriculture today. They're, we can't separate them out so much anymore. Tertiary is the service sector. These are the truck drivers that are driving the products back and forth across our country and getting the goods to our markets. And then the grocery salespeople that are selling those goods in our stores. That's tertiary. That's service sector. And then the quaternary sector. These are the researchers that... Now, there are two main types of agriculture. There's commercial and subsistence. You should have read about them. Commercials, basically, it's primary, primarily for sale. You're producing for somebody else. Oftentimes, you have monoculture, so you're an onion farmer or a wheat farmer. Now, there's a big concept here called economies of scale that I want you to know. Now, economies of scale is usually taught in the economic units later in the course, but economies of scale basically is the cost benefits of per unit cost by increasing the production and efficiency of something. So the overall cost of producing a good goes down as you produce more. Now, why? Maybe you use more tractors. Maybe you use better techniques of farming. And so you're, you get more efficiency. Your production goes up. And, but your overall costs go down as you produce more. Really, really important idea. So if that didn't make sense to you, make sure that you read a little bit about that. Now, subsistence agriculture, basically people are producing for direct consumption by their local population or themselves. Basically, they're trying to grow so that they're, they have enough food to feed their family. They might sell a little bit, but it's mostly for themselves. So make sure you understand subsistence agriculture. Now, you can have intensive or extensive land use. Now, this intensive idea has double meaning here. So intensive, this picture up here, we can see the rice paddies in China. This land is intensely being used. Every square inch of it is being used. There's an investment of a high input of labor and um, work that's being placed into this. Um, every square inch of it's being used. Now, here on the bottom left, this is extensive land use, and this is like a spectrum. It's either more intensive or less intensive or more extensive. Now, what you have here is you have cattle farming, like in Colorado where I live. You just let the cattle out and they graze around. You don't do much to it, and they just kind of graze. It's, you're not putting a lot of inputs into the land, all right? But you can still get outputs out of it from the cattle, but you're not investing and using every square inch of that land. Now, we also have labor intensive versus capital intensive. The picture on the top right here, this indicates labor intensive. Primarily, this farmer in Mexico is doing this work. Now, he has a little bit of capital, I mean the plow that he's doing this, but it's not particularly capital intensive, okay? But it's more labor intensive. The worker's doing most of the work. When people are picking um, fruit off a tree, that's labor intensive. Capital intensive down here at the bottom, large amounts of capital. Big machinery is going into this. This is much more capital intensive, and this improves um, economies of scale also. So knowing what labor and capital intensive means is really, really important for you to understand. Now, 
In addition, how does development connect? Well, labor intensive tends to occur more often in less developed countries or periphery countries. They have an abundance of labor, uh, lower labor costs typically, and so you'll have an abundance of this. So plantations are a good example of something like that might be pretty labor intensive. Coffee, you have to hand pick it a lot of times. So you, you see this in less developed countries a lot because you have a cheap labor supply and they can do the labor intensive work. Now the bottom right here, we have capital intensive agriculture. Um, this is rice farming or corn farming that's in mills and processed for commercial sale. Um, emerging economies oftentimes have this or semi-periphery countries or your, this is way more common in highly developed countries or core countries. So this is, it doesn't mean that capital intensive can't happen in a less developed country. It just means that it happens less often. But almost all farming in the United States or in highly developed countries is much more in capital intensive. But you can still have some labor intensive uh, farming there too. It's just a generality. Knowing what parts of the world uh, farming occurs is something that you need to look at your books in. Subsistence economy, just as I explained, if you know that a country is a less developed region of the world, such as parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, subsistence farming is going to be much more prevalent. If you go to places of Western Europe or in the United States, you're going to see much more commercial. But remember the semi-periphery countries of like Brazil and Mexico and Chile and parts of Northern Africa, oftentimes these emerging economies will produce and for commercial intents for the markets that are close by to them. So be aware of that pattern. Now, there's multiple agricultural revolutions that you need to be about. And this is gonna be, I'm talking about this first one with the first agricultural revolution is about early cities or markets and how they develop. So you need to be aware of that. You should read about this, but you have to know about these cultural hearths and in each of these cultural hearths, usually small towns and cities would emerge in the early civilizations and these towns would serve as a market. And where these hearths were, often some of the uh, ancient cities emerged. So read about that and make sure that you see that connection of these are some of the areas that first urbanized or have cities. The second agricultural revolution. Now this technology that's developed during the second agricultural revolution coincides with the industrial revolution. So industrial revolution is in the later unit in economic development, but make sure you understand what the industrial revolution is because these two revolutions are going hand in hand. They each are developing things that are improving each other. With the Industrial Revolution, usually focusing on manufacturing, but it assists in agricultural production too. So read about it and understand that connection. Now, side note, settlement patterns. Settlement patterns is just kind of stuck in here, but what are settlements? Well, they're little towns, and some of these towns might turn into bigger cities. So you need to be aware of this and be able to describe them. They might be follow a linear, they might be totally isolated, they might be dispersed and spread out, or they could be nucleated, or what we usually call in this course is clustered. Now these clustered areas, you can see more connections coming into these. These can emerge into bigger towns. Now these towns might ha obviously have markets, and then they uh, develop over time, and they start to move out. Now, one of the key things here is that some of these clustered cities are found during the and near the best farmland. And so as these cities expand, they start to take over some of the best farmland. That's a connection between these two units that you need to be aware of. But make sure you know some of the um, settlement patterns as you get ready for this exam. Another 5.2. We'll look at some aerial photography here. And we have three big types. The French long lot, the English meets and bounds, and the public land survey system. Now, the first two are pretty easy. French long lot, France. English meets and bounds, they're going to follow physical boundaries and and follow the geography and it's going to have the shortest distance because it's one of the older ones. And then the public land use survey is going to be something that's developed in the United States. So let's look at some aerial photography. So we look at this and we say this is in Hastings, Nebraska, which is a huge clue for you. You should say, all right, this is probably in the United States on the Great Plains. I can see a clustered settlement here of the city of Hastings. And then I can see these squares. See the linear lines of patterns of how the line is developed? This is indicating to me the public land survey or the township. It's kind of a variation of the township. But this is developed in the United States, and I can see this pattern. So I can indicate from this that this is the public land use the, um, survey because of the square elements that I can see on the diagram. Another one. Here's the French long lot. Now this is in Louisiana. Uh, it would occur in France, obviously, also. Um, but we can see these long, seen this little square here, 
we see these long patterns and they usually try what they're trying to do is maximize access to the river or a road you can see the road right here so they're trying to maximize um, the width of the city of the property in order to gain access to the river but also the road in order to move things around and you will see this pattern very commonly this will create a little tighter cluster along these roads so people will be closer together side by side um, but in order to gain access to this and you'll oftentimes in the United States you'll see this in uh, Louisiana in Canada you'll see it in Quebec and then obviously wherever the French settled you oftentimes see this pattern too third type is the meets and bounds this is one of the older ones uh, the meets and bounds systems was designed by the English this is Boston or outside of Boston and and you can start to see that the roads just kind of go the shortest distance it's kind of go there's and and it's not really a grid they're just going from point A to point B because at the time you would just walk so you'd want to walk across there or you would take a horse and a grid pattern didn't matter as much and it's just kind of out here and it follows the natural landscape so this is what the meets and bounds system would look like from a satellite image so be aware of these and study go back and look at these three to make sure you can identify them now you might be asked to identify and look at aerial photography so what we have here is this is in Kansas and we have 1972 this is similar to that other image we can start to see you can see that land survey system of the grids and the lines coming across here and then the red is a Landsat image that indicates that it's put into uh, productive use for farming so that's that indicates that there's agriculture growing on here. So in 1972, we can see that there's a lot of squares up in this area here. This area is not as intensely used. You can start to see some circles here. And this is that center pivot irrigation. But we jump ahead to 2011, jump over here, and look at how much more land has been put into place. And a lot of it has to do with the center pivot. See the big circles here? This is a form of irrigation and so it's converted over and this indicates a much more now let's come back this is an indicating commercial agriculture this is not a subsistence farming agricultural pattern at all it is a commercial capital intensive land use um, in the united states in the great plains and using irrigation to do this so make sure that you can identify that and you're familiar with that now the von thunen model Von Thunen is a big deal, and I'm not going to go over all the Von Thunen model, but here you go. At the center of the Von Thunen model is an urban market, and then you have different land uses as you extend out, and transportation is important here, and the intensity of land use. So what we have here is the bid rent model, which is an urban concept, and land closer to the market is worth more, and as you move away, the rents go down. So you're going to use the land more intensely, as you're closer to the city and grow crops that are, are high cash value, easy to transport, but are more valuable. As you move away, your land is gonna be used more extensively because the land is not worth as much. And then this is where you'll raise cattle and then you have the intermediate areas here, of dairy and grains and things like that that you use to feed the farm animals or the grazing animals. So this is an application of using bid rent model in an agricultural context. Also, you can look at where cities are across the world, across the country. Here's the market of New York City. And as you extend across, this intensive of land use and the value of goods as you extend. So make sure you look at these in your textbooks about how these different crops um, work. More valuable land, more intense. Less valuable land, more extensive and more spread out. This is where Kansas is right out here. Those, those farms that we saw, beef and cattle where I am in Colorado, less less more extensively used and not as intense this gives you a sense of the von thunen model or with markets and cities at the center here's the european application big population center here and as you extend out extensive land use extends out now this isn't the perfect application but it works pretty well